Hello and good evening. My name is Joel Wilson, and I'm one of the hosts for this evening's STEM Forward. Tonight, we're gonna to be focusing in on applied mathematics, counting, and the numbers. Our two um, distinguished hosts, Dr. John Spencer and Dr. Stephen Jones. John Spencer, Spencer is an award-winning uh, public school principal right here in the city of Philadelphia, where he has uh, showcased uh, STEM in, in almost every discipline that uh, K to eighth grade students um, can participate can participate in. And Dr. Stephen Jones is Assistant Dean of Engineering at Villanova University and has been doing STEM programs for over 30 years. So tonight we're going to have just a, a great, great program um, talking about the applied mathematics, counting, and the numbers. Many of you may say, well, what is that? What is applied mathematics? Well, this live stream web webinar will discuss the growing professions that require a foundation in mathematics. This webinar is for STEM professionals and students. We intend to talk about K-12 and college students' ability to pursue STEM careers where math is the foundation. Our goal is to bridge the gap in conversations about STEM careers that include math, we will discuss curriculum types that improve each student's ability to achieve academic and career excellence as a STEM student. Our unique STEM Forward webinar will provide enlightening, practical, and actionable steps to transform K-12 and college education. The future of STEM careers is now. So let's go ahead and jump right into this exciting program. Our first segment, how to get the required K-12 education for applied mathematics. How to get the required K-12 education for applied mathematics. So, Dr. Spencer, we're going to bring you right into this. Mm -hmm. uh, when should students start taking math, science, engineering, business, and computer-related courses or experiences? Well, I'm going to say math as soon as they come out of the womb. You know, math, math is something that should be within the household always around, you know, from, you know, from the very beginning, counting numbers. There's all types of, of song games you can do with your children in terms of counting. You know, one of the things that has happened, Joel, as a result of the pandemic um, is learning loss. And one of the places where I see it the most is in mathematics. And so children are having trouble with something that we call automaticity, where they don't know how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide um, in their head and, and, and on a regular uh, rate and speed. You know, they're very reliant on calculators and things of that nature. If you think back to when we were in school, we had to memorize the times table 0 through 12. And so not having to memorize and, and not doing those types of things cuts down on the automaticity. So one of the things I would say to parents at this point is buy some flashcards, make some flashcards, whether, you know, if they're uh, K to one, K to two, you know, two, uh, three and four digit um, addition and subtraction, as they get a little older, start quizzing them on their multiplication of their time table. When you go to the store, when you're in a supermarket, have them keep a running list of, of the items that you're buying and, and add it up before they get to the cash register. So, so those are some of the simple things that parents can do. So when they get to school, they have that mathematical foundation. Then you can go to things like algebra and calculus. But but you can't move to that realm if you don't have the mathematical foundation. There. So, Dr. Spencer, I want to just stay with you uh, for, for one more uh, question, because it sort of piggybacks on, on what you were just talking about. 
So mm-hmm. specifically in the K-12 environment, what are the types of math related issues that students uh, should encounter? Well, you know, K to, K to eight, you have your basic mathematics, your basic arithmetic, but as you move into fourth and fifth grade and, and further, you move into um, rudimentary al- algebraic functions. So by time, you really should have an algebra course in eighth grade. But a lot of times our children do not have the foundational skills um, because algebra is the gateway to more sophisticated mathematics. You know, one of the things, you know, that I try to get across to my students is how they will use math in every facet of their life. You don't think you do, but we use math every single day. Okay, okay. So, uh, uh, Dr. Jones, uh, let's get you in this conversation. So, um, the audience may not know, but you've been running STEM programs for 30 years now. Um, You were even one of my (laughs) advisors when I was in a program called Prime. Uh, So, you're old, not me. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> uh, but so how um, in your programs and the programs that you design, um, do you do you have the students sort of learning math in conjunction with technology? Right. So my my programs are um, actually largely for like eighth grade through 12th grade. They're STEM programs that I have on my campus. I work at Villanova University. I'm an associate dean in the College of Engineering. So what we try to do is take math and apply it to the things that our students are learning when they're in our programs. I have a seven Saturday program in the spring for students who are interested in engineering. Then I have a summer program. But we're really trying to show them how in real life in real situations, math is actually applied. I think that that's the missing component when they're in uh, in their K-12 schools, don't always show them how to apply the mathematics, but we really wanna make sure that if they're considering engineering, they're considering the sciences, that they're applying information. And that's kind of the critical thing is that they they wanna have um, the ability to become those engineers because they understand that math is used throughout it and that, that that could give them the foundation for going to high school and therefore taking the additional algebra uh, pre-calculus and calculus so they can stay in the engineering field. That's okay. kind of my agenda. So Dr. Jones, I, I, I wanna piggyback uh, with, with this question for you. So in the, in the, at the college level, at the collegiate level, do you recommend uh, your students uh, to serve as math tutors, and if so, why? Well, I think the wonderful thing about tutoring is that you're giving up your time, and tutoring actually becomes a refresher. So in other words, the student is refreshing their own knowledge by tutoring someone else. And also what I've seen is students realize that they maybe they did forget some of the math, and they'll actually go do the research so that they can work with the students one-on-one or work with students in a group. But I wanted to say, uh, I wanna say that student to all students, it's a smart student that goes to see a tutor that goes to get help in whatever subject that you're in. A lot of times students come to college and they believe that they were the, that they have all the knowledge that they need because they were the top of their high school. But when you get to college, it's another level of knowledge. And I have had students who are earning A's and B's go for tutoring. So it's a wise student, especially in the math and sciences area that goes right away. Uh, When you get that first test back and it may not be exactly what you expected, go get tutoring right away. Absolutely. Don't talk about me on this program. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, Dr. Um, uh, Spencer, so a, a similar question for you. You're in the, in the K-12 space uh, right now. You're principal of K-8. to So how do you see tutoring play out in, in that particular space? Now, tutoring it is very important. Now, actually, this past week, uh, we started reaching out to one of our university partners to do exactly what Steve said, to bring in college students to work with our children uh, to strengthen their mathematical skills. One of the points that we talked about a little bit earlier, I mentioned earlier, 
Algebraic thinking and concepts are introduced in kindergarten. And, and what that entails, uh, you know, children understand how to make mental images, whether it's drawing, sounds, um, uh, verbal explanations, expressions of equations, um, subtracting, add addition and subtracting word problems and things of that nature. People don't necessarily think of that as algebra. So, so bringing in students from colleges who've had advanced mathematics, especially those who want to be teachers, and, and that's who we're targeting, and also mathematicians, you know, to come explain and expose our children to advanced mathematics and also to help them with their skills. So it becomes very important, but also it, it exposes our children to college at an early age because they get to meet a college student. Mm -hmm. So doc, Dr. Um, Spencer, that's, that's um, interesting because I know just on social media, I've seen a lot of memes that say things like, um, I've never used algebra since ninth grade. Uh, have you seen that? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I've seen things like that. And be, because honestly, I think we do a poor job of teaching mathematics in the United States. And, and that's why, you know, when we talked about doing our first program for our second season, we said we needed to highlight math and STEM because people only think of it as, you know, for engineering. But math it, is part of our lives. I mean, mm -hmm. from buying groceries to putting gas in your car, um, you know, getting on the bus, knowing how far you have to walk, you know, buying your trans pass and things of that nature. We use math every single day. But most people don't understand what algebraic thinking is because a lot of times they did not have good instruction or actually told what algebraic thinking is. Like solving for X, X is the unknown. Mm -hmm. So, like I was just giving an example, doing a word problem in kindergarten is algebraic thinking. That's excellent. That's excellent. So I, I definitely agree that, um, you know, we need to put more information out there to, to sort of counter, especially with social media now. It's right. just putting so much just fake news out there <laughs> in every discipline. Um, so Dr. Jones, just wanted to ask you a question uh, regarding STEM and competitions. How do you see this as a component, or do you see it as a component for students to really become, you know, better in pursuing STEM? Yeah, it's it's always great to um, well, we have competitions with my students, so we'll race robots, uh, we'll race cars. Do they fight? Do robots fight? Yeah, uh, not, I'm not at that level, but I have seen that. I have been to some of those competitions where the robots actually uh, fight or they run into each other at different competitions. But it's fun. It's it's fun to actually take uh, and measure the speed, you know, the of the cars. Or we've done um, egg drops from a, a two-story high position and drop the egg to see, you know, how fast it's going to come down and uh, whether they're able to protect that A from that distance. So you get to actually see some of the real ways that we try to protect things when we're shipping them to various places around the globe. So it, it has very practical applications across it. One of the things that we've been doing lately um, is programming of drones. So programming involves some logic and planning and I think that that's important in math as well, that you're using your logic and you're planning how you're going to respond to the mathematical problem. And that's something that students sometimes don't get in the schools that they're attending, the ability to do the problem solving um, and real world problem solving. That's what, one of the things that we're trying to bring to them through our universities. OK, that sounds that sounds uh, great. So, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Spencer, do you have anything that you may want to add about uh, STEM groups and competitions? Yeah, so, so one of the things that we do at our school, we, we have these, um, I think they're called Ozobots. So, so we do this with our kindergartners, where one of the tasks that they have to do um, is use this magnetic tape and develop a course which the Ozobot can follow without bumping into each other. But sometimes they do like to crash the robot show. <laughs> you know, they, they, they think it's fun. And so we don't necessarily discourage that, but you know, and they get very competitive, but also as a school, we compete 
in Science Olympiad within the Philadelphia area. But the sad thing is we are one of the few public schools that devote resources to participate in Science Olympiad. Before the um, pandemic, we probably had 75 students on our Science Olympiad team. Wow. Wow, that's in, in, in incredible. So, uh, Dr. Spencer, you, you well, have you know, what? you know what? We also run a nice Saturday program with a nonprofit called Tech Core 2 run mm -hmm. by Mr. Joel Wilson that, that yeah. does coding with, with, with our children. And we have about 40 children in that on Saturdays as well. Yeah, that, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, doc, Dr. Spencer, I see you have your kindergartners doing algebra problems and, and building killer robots. <laughs> <laughs> so I know the parents are just knocking your door down to get their kids in there. And uh, we'll be right back. I appreciate we just uh, finished up on our first segment. We'll be right back um, after our this commercial break. Hi, I'm Joel Wilson. President and CEO of JCW Computer Consulting, LLC, a technology implementation firm with over 20 years of satisfying customers. We offer a full spectrum of industry top tier branded services. We are an authorized partner or reseller for Lenovo, Zoom, T-Mobile, Microsoft 365 and Surface tablets, Google Workspace, Acer, Asus, Samsung, PCmatic security software, and many more. Our online store features laptops, Chromebooks, computers, printers, accessories, and software. Businesses, take advantage of our free one-hour Zoom tech consultation and know we offer top nationwide high-speed internet service providers, voice over IP, and cellular phone services. Home users, don't miss our current in-stock Chromebook inventory. Please visit us at jcwcc.com or call 215 879-6701. So we are back. And we want to make sure to, to everyone out there in, in the the internet, <laughs> please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the like button. We're moving on to our next segment. Segment two, the college and training experience. The college and training experience. So we know that Dr. Jones is uh, the assistant uh, dean of engineering for Villanova University, and he has um, and he's also worked at uh, Drexel University. Both schools have strong, very strong engineering programs. So he has a, a lot of just firsthand knowledge of what the college experience is like for, for students who are pursuing engineering. And so the first question is going to go to uh, Dr. Jones. So, Dr. Jones, uh, from your experience, are the AP, the Advanced Placement and Honor classes, are they worth high school students taking? So I think every student, if you have an opportunity to take AP classes, uh, should do that because it will prepare you. What are AP classes? I should say that first. AP classes are advanced placement classes. These are classes that are offered by most a number of high schools in the region that are college level courses that have have uh, more requirements, more responsibility that's laid on a student to uh, present information based on their instruction. Uh, it is a opportunity for a student to also at the end of the course take a test if you score a four or a five, you'll actually earn college credits. You can take those college credits with you as you go to your first year of college. That'd be one less course that you can have to take, or you can use it to replace something else. So I think it is a great exposure in terms of even mental, I call it mental exercise, that you're working your mind at a higher level so that when you get to college, it won't be the first time that you ever worked that hard or that you've ever been challenged by your instructors to present information in a certain way. I think AP classes and honors classes are perfect for that student who really wants to excel as they're applying to colleges as well. The colleges love to see those honors classes and AP classes where you've earned A's in those classes. And that helps them in making a decision about 
how determined you are, how committed you are to the education experience that you went through at your high school. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, um, Dr. Spencer, in the uh, I know in high school and in, in, in in your high school years, you can take advanced placement and you can take um, honors classes. But are there some type of advanced classes that students in the K to eight can take? Well, um, not necessarily. The push is to try to have more K to eights offer algebra um, in eighth grade so they can take the keystone and actually move forward uh, with more advanced math in high school. But to, to get to those keystone, I mean, to get to those advanced placement and more in honors classes and more advanced math classes, we have to strengthen the mathematical foundation for all of our students. So like I said earlier, parents, if you're not doing drills with your students, um, you need to do it at home. If they don't understand their times table and, and understand how to uh, do uh, addition and subtraction in their head, with the regular automaticity, you know, that that is something that, that you can work with them and to improve. Uh, one of the things uh, I remember being a principal at another school, I used to hear my children argue about basketball every morning, like they're the general manager. You know, they're, they're working on free throw percentages, three point percentages, and, 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 you know, all this advanced mathematics, but they didn't understand that they were talking about advanced mathematics. And so one of the things that I talk to my teachers about are making and using real world situations so children understand how this math works every day in their life and some of the things that they love to do and just some of the things that they have to do. So, so we have to make math real. And also if, if you wanna have a sustainable um, economic outlook for your life, you have to understand math. One, one of the things that, that, that um, as an educator that I hate to see, I hate to go to a store and the cashier struggles giving change, especially if the computer doesn't tell them exactly what to give back. And so that to me as the educator, I'm like, you know, ha you know, we have to do a better job in preparing students. Yeah, one of, one of, I don't want to say um, one of the things that I've done in some of the seminars that uh, I do with the schools is I actually had them start, I would give the students uh, $200,000 to start their own business. This not real money. No money? <laughs> <laughs> not real money. But I would say you have $200,000 to start your business and give them all the parameters in terms of staffing and supplies and demand. And then they realized how fast the money ran out if they didn't budget. And so that made it more practical and real for them to actually think about how the math can be used in a practical way in starting a business, um, that you just don't start a business, start buying things and selling things. There's a whole financial side to it that you need to know how to manage the, the money. So I think that giving them these practical applications is important. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, uh, Dr. Spencer, I have a, 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 a question for you. I know a lot of times, you know, as the adults, whether we're teachers or mentors or principals, counselors, we're telling students, you know, you should apply for STEM, apply for STEM. And sometimes we don't even explain what STEM is. So give me your 60 second pitch of why a student should apply to college or training program that offer mathematics, engineering, or a science degree. Well, one of the things that I talk to, to my students K to eight is about economic sustainability, about, you know, having a good life to, to live out your dreams. And, and whether it's going to trade school or going to college, many of the jobs that have, that are exist now may exist in the future. will sometime will revolve around science, technology, engineering, and math. So math is like the forgotten part of STEM. Because honestly, you need math for the other four components. But also even to me, I count accounting and bookkeeping as a STEM job. Because like I think recently, um, two economists won the Nobel Prize. 
um, within the last two weeks, I, I think, or within the last month, I heard that to be an economist is to understand math and to be a mathematician. Mm-hmm. You know, so if also if you think about promoting black business, we need accountants. And if you don't have a certain mathematical acuity to to run your business, and like like Steve said, to understand how to allocate the resources, you know, so going into STEM related careers gives you a certain certain amount of economic viability. It also, you know, if, if you're a creative person, like my, my daughter's in college and, and she's majoring something uh, that's real creative, but in the root of it, with the technology and the different things she has to learn how to use, it's a STEM career. But when you look at it, at just at the title of the major, you wouldn't think of it. But, but with the advancements of technology, you can't run away from it. And one of the things that we learned about from the pandemic is that many of our children were just, and adults were just consumers of technology. They didn't know how to become producers with technology. And, and that, that was a major hurdle especially when it came to K-12 education. Mm-hmm. And so, Dr. Spencer, you, you raise a, a great point. So there's now an intersection between math and the arts with, um, as, um, with crypto with what are called NFTs because mm-hmm. NFTs are allowing um, artistic endeavors to be sold and, and owning and you have a, a better control over ownership. So um, that, you know, that's that's math. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, Dr. Jones, I did want to get your your, you know, what is your 60 second pitch of why a student should pursue, um, you know, mathematics, engineering or a science degree? Well, again, if we look at the economic side of it, a student that earns a college degree and that's just a general college degree will earn a million dollars more in their lifetime than a student without a college degree. No, so I, when I again, when I'm doing seminars, I, I'll ask that question. What can you do that's a legitimate job where you could actually earn a million dollars over a lifetime? And the average engineer coming out of undergrad school today, which we know it requires a lot of mathematics to be an engineer, is going to earn sixty five to seventy thousand dollars just coming out with an undergraduate degree. So their life potential of earning is well beyond $1 million in their lifetime. And so you want to position yourself to have the education, the training. And as I was talking to a student today to even consider going to graduate school, which is where you earn a master's degree with two additional years of of education. Um, And then you can actually earn an additional $20,000 a year with that additional education. And you're going to work 30 or 40 years after you have the degree. So it's well, well worth the investment of your time and your, the investment of getting the additional knowledge as well. So, um, Dr. Jones, let me follow up with, we were talking about someone's going to a college or university, so they're getting a, um, you know, a BS. Uh, but what about for the individuals that may opt to go to, say, a training program or a technical degree? And if if you're going into one of those programs, if you could just speak to sort of salary, sort of what are the expectations they can make coming out of it? And what is the value of them interning while they're pursuing that technical degree? You know, I I think that internships are phenomenal. They are the greatest way to actually take some of the learning that you've experienced in the classroom and actually go out into the field to apply it. I know that there are training programs, for example, where maybe you, you're working with autonomous vehicles or uh, you're working with various types of manufacturing environments where there are training programs that you actually go through. And those training programs are preparing you to, and you can get additional training programs and certifications to do those types of jobs. So even though, I, I you know, like you said, I'm encouraging college attendants there are other types of trainings and opportunities that and educational programs that individuals should take to. There are tech, even in dentistry, there are tech parts of dentistry where you could do an 18-month, uh, two-year training program to provide and take care of the technology within that. So just developing yourself, um, getting different exposures, all of those really help you 
to advance within your career and give you a greater opportunity um, to earn more in, in your lifetime. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, um, Dr. Dr. Spencer, so our audience may not know that you are actually a graduate of one of the famous HBCUs, Morgan State University, and you are actually currently an adjunct professor at Lincoln University. And I was just at your homecoming, so I didn't see you there, but anyway. <laughs> 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 and you won. Right. So, so congratulations. You won homecoming. Um, but, uh, so, so, so that was Lincoln's homecoming. Morgan's homecoming is this weekend. Oh, so that's your out? Okay, I got oh, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah what, when I teach and when I went to. Okay. So at um so at, at Lincoln, with your interaction with students, um, do you talk to them or give them any guidance about how they should, you know, uh you know, how they should use the, the, the career center on Lincoln's campus. Yeah, so, so, so one of the things that, um, and I'm preparing the next generation uh, education leaders, next generation of principals at, at Lincoln University. And one of the things that we always talk about are our career paths within education, whether it's public K-12 school, schools uh, or some other avenue of entrepreneurship or educational entrepreneurship. And I always harp on them understanding how to use technology to make their job easier and to become more organized because organizational leadership in, in a K-12 organization is very important. You know, with, with all the things that, that a modern principal is asked to do, if you don't know how to use technology to make your day easier and to make sure you're communicating with all your community stakeholders, it will give you a hard way to go. Hmm. Okay. But yeah, Lincoln's an excellent university, excellent graduate program. I'm very impressed by my students. As a matter of fact, I had class last night and several of them have told me about new jobs that they've gotten and you know, why they're in the program. So I'm pretty pleased. Wow, that's incredible. That's incredible. So um, Dr. Jones, um, I, I know you've often talked about Villanova and your your career center there. So what insight do you share with your students about how they should engage the career center and when they should engage it? Okay. Um, but I, I wanted to share at least that I have a degree from Howard University. So there's another HDUCU uh, person in this group. Um, but you know, I, one of the things that I say to every student, don't wait until your senior year to connect with the career center. Most college campuses have a career day where they invite alumni, they invite uh, corporations to come in to meet with their students to offer them internships and job opportunities. I know we have one of those during the spring or fall and the spring. We have these career days that you can come in and take advantage of. And so um, they will help you to write your resume, um, get your resume up and going, get you connected to LinkedIn where there are a lot of job opportunities. And I tell students, when you get on LinkedIn, find your alumni groups. You know, there's a Villanova alumni group for the entire university, but there's also a engineering alumni group. So find your groups and connect with them and begin to build into your week, at least one day a week, that's kind of your career time where you're looking at, you know, internship opportunities, you're filling out forms, uh, you're talking to professors, you're talking, you're going to visit certain um, panels that are happening on your campus, but you take charge of your future career from day one. And also you're at asking questions so you can figure out, is this exactly what I want to do? Or is there another element of this particular field that I've started to study in that I want to do? And you can actually have those questions answered earlier in your college experience then you will have an opportunity to take classes that are more directed in where you want to go. And also you'll look for more internships where in the area that you want to go into. So it's, it's, it's something that from day one, when you get on the university campus and they tell you what a career center, go make yourself known that you're a student that's really interested in developing opportunities. Even in your first year, you can get a good internship. My daughter got a internship with Lockheed Martin her first year out so she was taking advantage of 
and networking with those companies so she could get the opportunity. And I encourage all the students to do that. That's some great, um, just some great uh, insight that you provided. So just have a follow up question for, for you, Dr. Jones. Um, do you recommend students volunteer for research at the university level? And if so, why? There's, there is a great opportunity on, on all campuses, especially those science areas, those engineering areas, to do research alongside of a professor. A couple of things can happen. When a professor is doing research, they publish what they've researched. And if you've been working with them, you could actually have yourself published with their research, which will make you um, kind of an expert and have some basic knowledge in the area of that research. And then you can add that to your resume as something that's distinctive from what other students have done at the university. It's a great exposure. Some of those opportunities to work in a research lab are paid positions. So you actually can get paid as an undergrad in the research lab, get to know some of the faculty, get them to know you outside of the classroom. And it does influence your grades when they see how knowledgeable you are and how engaged you are in the things that interest them the most. So I would encourage all students to consider that. Some of those research opportunities are during the academic year, and some of those research opportunities are during the summer where you actually can live on campus and work on a project with a faculty member during the summer. Most of those summer programs or summer research opportunities are about 10 weeks. Wow, that's incredible. That's incredible. So Dr. Spencer, I have a, um, a, a statement that um, a lot of students hear, uh, but they may not understand the statement. So I want you to either shed light on whether you agree or you disagree with the statement. Consider studying abroad to get a different type of, to get different types of real world math problems uh, in other countries. Mm -hmm. So should a student consider doing some type of study abroad so that they can see how math is engaged in use in a professional level in other countries. What do you think? No, I, I, I do agree. And, and that's something that I'm encouraging uh, my own children to do. You know, I'm an HBCU uh, advocate, um, especially at the undergraduate level. Um, if you look at, um, I know Malcolm Gladwell put out some research uh, within the last couple of years that talked about how uh, for example, physics. Um, I think Dillard in Louisiana put out more black physicists than Harvard in, in a particular year. Where Harvard had one, Dillard had 13. Wow. Um, so, so I'm a big proponent because if you look at um, the more difficult majors in college, HBCU still produced the majority of blacks with those difficult degrees. I mean, I myself have my bachelor's degree in, in biology from Morgan. And I know at the time, Morgan was, was the number one school in Maryland for producing African-Americans with biology degrees, and I think chemistry degrees and engineering degrees at the time. So when I, when I think about studying abroad, I think about Africa. I'm not thinking about going to Europe. I'm not thinking about going to Asia, South America. I'm encouraging my children, and I've had friends, especially their children have gone to HBCUs, they have gone to Africa. That's incredible. That is incredible. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Jones, do you have any uh, thoughts on this? Yeah, we, um, you know, most of the universities have study abroad. Of course, COVID has brought some of that to a, a halt. Um, some countries are starting to open up. But it's all about uh, learning different languages, learning other ways that people live. And we also send our students out to do real life projects. For example, we send our students out to help build a village in Africa. Uh, we help them to develop uh, wells and, and, and use solar technology to get uh, cell phones in certain areas of Africa. So we, we try to you know, take the learning that we're giving them in the classroom 
to a real live exposure where they actually go to another country and they give and they support um, those various individuals in the communities that are, are there. The use of um, knowledge, I think, inspires them because they actually can see the benefits and, the, and then they can see that these there are other uh, people from other countries who have certain kinds of needs and we want to be a university that contributes to that. Okay, that is incredible. And that's going to bring us to the to the end of our second segment. And we're going to take a short pause for a commercial break. Are you frustrated with your do-it-yourself website project? Do-it-yourself website building is not as easy as some companies make it out to be. At Teacher Labs, let us help you with your website project. Through our remix services, we can turn your DIY template into a website that tells the story of your brand. Our remix services include logos, video, audio, images, and color schemes. Step into the Teacher Lab for a remix that doesn't skip a beat. Visit our website at teachitlabs.com and contact us now. So don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the like button. Welcome back to segment three, segment three. What are the careers in applied mathematics? The careers, because the students, they're not going to universities and spending all this money or going to a, a technical school or uh, even a six month program. They, they, you know, they want an ROI, a return on that investment. And so uh, you two gentlemen, we really want to know, we want to know what are the careers in applied mathematics? So this first question is going to go to you, Dr. Jones. What are the careers in the applied mathematics field? <laughs> so, of course, I'm going to be biased here and I'll say, you know, all of engineering, there is applied mathematics in civil electrical, chemical, mechanical, even the biological engineering. Uh, and the application of that is what you see in society, what you use every day, the creation of, of um, things that both keep you well, that protect you. All of that is applying the mathematics that engineers learn through their curriculum. Now, the other sides of the house, which include business where you're applying mathematics, Mm -hmm. um, there are individuals who are learning um, that to use it in the insurance industry that's applied mathematics, uh, statistics, especially as we talk about a lot of the sports. Um, and now they're using uh, all kinds of technology along with their analysis uh, of, of players. They're actually, for example, putting sensors on individuals and measuring their strength, measuring their speed. That's applied mathematics. So it, it, it involves every aspect of our lives uh, down to the business student, um, down to the nursing student, because they're giving certain kinds of medications. They're applying mathematics and what they do. And so what I would like for individuals who are listening tonight is to think about, wow, I math applies across a lot of different professions, and I need to have some basic proficiency in that in order to be successful in society. And that starts in the early years that I'm talking to parents right now is making sure that your child gets a grounded in mathematics as early as like uh, Dr. Spencer was saying, when they're born, introducing mathematics in fun ways so that as they go along the pathway, they grow stronger and have more knowledge. And I say to the parents, don't tell your, your children that you don't like math or you've never done math well. When you see you've been given a gift in a child that loves mathematics and loves to work on the problems, encourage them, give them good words, words and support to encourage to help them to understand that they can do it. We as parents, our words, our power and influence in our children's lives. And we want them to go into these professions where our numbers are still small. We still need a lot more of presence of students of color in these professions. So, Dr. Jones, it's that's interesting, and and what your words when you talk about parents and what in the power of parents with encouraging words. I just want to share just a really, really brief story. So, 
you know, I was I was blessed. I was a pretty strong math student. So I, I, I did take algebra one in eighth grade, Dr. Spencer. And then um, I took calculus actually in um, I might have took it in like 11th grade. I mean, I was just it, it advanced. And what was so funny was that, you know, I had like a set almost a set time when I did homework at night and, and my mom would come home and she would sort of review it. She would like look at stuff or whatever. And, you know, I graduated high school and that was that. And then later in life, she told me, she said, Joe, I never understood what you were doing. I was shocked because I swore that this, like, if I wasn't on my game, this woman was going to be on my neck. <laughs> and she just faked the funk all those years. <laughs> you know what, Joe? One of the things we tell parents don't share your negative math stories with your yeah. children. Because, I mean, a lot of times children are defeated with math before they even start. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you watch a, ch a child play a video game, something like Fortnite, all the calculations that they have to do just to be good at the game mm. shows that there's a mathematical acuity there. But we don't nurture, it's not nurtured in our society, you know, in, in terms of, of um, certain academics, academic traits, and, and the advent of social media um, ha has made it worse. Um, one of the things, you know, I talk to, yes, I am for children going to college, but there's also alternative paths. And one of the things, if you look at the certificate and diploma programs at Community College of Philadelphia, you will see if you go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and look up the salaries and the growth in those areas, you wouldn't have to worry about $15 an hour. In this economy, you probably make close to $20 or $30 an hour. Mm -hmm. You know, so th there's, there's all types of paths that you can go with in terms of STEM. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes STEM has an A in it that makes it STEAM. And art, art is mathematics. Mm -hmm. Whether you're making um, a painting, whether you're a sculptor um, or do abstract art or you're animated, you're using math. Math is in everything we do. Whether it's designing clothes, clothes or growing food, being a farmer. You know, being a farmer nowadays, you got to learn how to use a drone. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, and buildings, uh, buildings and bridges, you know, they those are aesthetic and and their design. So, the 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 arts plays into the design of buildings, and and that's something that has to be considered as well. Absolutely, absolutely. I just wanted to mention um, last over the weekend, I I took a group of students up to Williamson College of the Trades. If mm -hmm. uh, you gentlemen are familiar and, and really and it's a three year it's a three year school um, technical degree school. You get a, a, an associate's degree and it's a hundred hundred percent tuition is, is paid for the students room and board. It's only for young men. You have to be between 18 and 20. And so they're getting STEM degrees in carpentry construction. Um, they have a like a, a power plant class. With, with physics, you know, you know, in a class, all these degrees, five job offers to every graduate, uh, starting salary, typically 50,000 and within five years to making a hundred thousand dollars, they have no debt. So these, it's, it's all STEM degrees. Mm -hmm. And they even have a program on um, landscaping, uh, landscape engineering. Yep. Now la landscaping is, is a big thing. I mean, if, if you think about, um climate change and how the importance and in, in, in some communities the scarcity of water you know i remember being a, a principal um at a school in west philadelphia and the water department in our city is is building or installing certain things to capture rainwater you know in the urban environment and part of that is is a landscape architect you know you got to know what type of soil what type of grass you know how, how does it need to be sloped? What type of tree? You know, what type of root system can survive in a confined place and things like that? So mm -hmm. I think we have to do a better job of educating the community, you know, what STEM actually is and that it actually touches all parts of our lives 
and people can find their niche within. So Dr. Spencer, let me um, throw this question at you. So one of the things we're experiencing now <clears throat> with the convergence of technology and finance is a new segment called FinTech. Mm -hmm. In FinTech, we've seen the explosion of this is where Square has, has popped up and, and PayPal and other companies like that. So what are your thoughts for you know, the viability of career paths for young folks who, who, like you say, may be strong in math, and now it's this this new thing, FinTech. Do you think these are viable career paths for young people yeah. to pursue? Joe, most definitely. And one of the things the pandemic really pushed us for, like I belong to a credit union. And so when the credit union finally opened back up, I went, I noticed there were no more tellers. It was these machines. So I, I'm talking, I'm opening the bank account for my daughter. So I'm talking to the young woman that's helping us. She's like, you know, I used to be a talent, but they gave me a promotion and started giving me classes on coding. And, you know, so now I'm doing more. And then I read an article, I think it was in the Financial Times, how I'm not sure if it was Wells Fargo or Bank of America. They've taken their teller class and started giving them coding and other technological courses to build from within their internal workforce and repurposing them to meet their technology needs. So it's evolving because of the machines that they put in and those machines are really vending machines and cash registers. And, and that is actually one of the things you can go to school for, whether it's a CTE school or go to community college and learn how to fix those machines. And it pays over $20 an hour. And wow. it's not necessarily a, a, a four year program. Some programs may be, um, 12 to 24 months to learn how to service and take care of those machines. So, so FinTech, because during the height of the lockdown, depending on what state you're in, you can go to the bank. So for the first time, people were forced to do deposits over their phone of checks. And for a lot of people, that was a big thing. And what if you didn't have a checking account or a bank account? What were you going to do? So, so the pandemic, like I said to people in a lot of ways, it has forced certain equalities to happen and it's been a gift and a curse, mm -hmm. you know, in terms like well, I think about my own situation in Philadelphia, it forced a one to one technology for all students, regardless of where they were. Mm -hmm. it, it pushed the issue of access to the Internet for the entire city. So it's been a gift and a curse. But yeah, FinTech, um, I, I've read stories, you know, how in India, you know, they've used cell phones to, to bring banking and currencies out into the most rural parts of India. Right. right. So, so FinTech is not going away. It's just going to get more sophisticated. Also, I, know I read a story about how the Chinese are moving into crypto and at some point want to move the yuan into crypto. Wow. Wow. And for all those uh, who are investing in crypto, Bitcoin, Crossed sixty six thousand dollars this week. I think mm -hmm. it pulled back a little bit to sixty two thousand today. So mm -hmm. just some information. So, Doctor uh, Spencer, mm -hmm. what are the careers that reduce world problems? I'm sorry, Doctor Jones. Doctor Jones. <laughs> well, we um, environmental uh, sustainability are areas that we've actually been building up over the last five years. We started off. Mm -hmm with a bachelor's degree, now we have a master's degree because so many of our students want to have an impact on the environment. And we know with all the things that are going on with, um, that actually in California right now, you know, they've had all the fires and now they're getting a tremendous amount of rain. So they're concerned about mudslides. Mm -hmm. So we need more individuals with these kind of backgrounds in sustainability and dealing with the issues of the environment to, ensure that people are safe wherever they're living because you know it's it's actually kind of forcing people to move away from certain areas because of the environment that they're living in and the changes that we're going in so you know for those of us who believe that there's really global warming um <laughs> there are thousands upon thousands of jobs that are going to be created as a result of the of the flooding and other kinds of uh, catastrophes that we have to deal with and it, that's a great opportunity okay um dr spencer do you maybe have uh one career path you want to throw out there 
real quick that solves problems. What is a career that reduces world problems? Maybe like, like an aquatic engineer. I would, we have a lot of plastic waste in the ocean that, that's decomposing. And within the last couple of years, there have been a lot of different engineers trying to develop robots that can collect all the um, plastic. Because most people understand that plastic is a petroleum product and it comes from oil. And so that that is, I think on Google Earth, you can actually see the big trash swirl in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also one in the North Atlantic. And it's just amazing. And most of the waste goes back to the 60s. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, Dr. Dr. Uh, Jones, this last question is going to go uh, to you. What are careers in research in applied mathematics? The the careers that are often um, offered are through the mathematics department itself. So you can actually do research on certain types of projects, solving problems that involve math around the world, uh, that involve, uh, for example, with COVID, like that, the whole um, following of the, the problems with COVID and the research involved with that, there's a whole numbers um, opportunity in that. So you might have applied mathematics in that coming out of the math department doing the research and the numbers and trying to help them to make good decisions about the implementation of different types of medicines that are coming out to address COVID. So they're, you know, just using that particular department, the mathematics department. Another area where applied math would happen, it would be in the physics department. Uh, I was amazed when, uh, again, my daughter was going through her engineering degree, how much physics she had to take as part of that. And physics has a good math component in it as well uh, in terms of how things interact, one thing interacts with another. And so looking at the college from a different exposure um, and opportunity by talking to the professors in various departments, you'll then know what kind of research they're doing and how it applies to real life situations that we experience every day. Okay. Okay. And so, um, uh, Dr. Spencer, I don't know if you have anything you may want to add real, real quick to that. Uh, yeah, I, I was just thinking, even as a biology major at Morgan State, I had to take two semesters worth of physics uh, to get my degree. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> so we we have uh, come to the uh, the end of our program. This yep. has just been such a a, 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 a great a great. I think it's one more commercial. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, we'll be right back after this next commercial. <laughs> Do you want your students to earn excellent grades? This is Dr. Stephen Jones, author of Seven Secrets of How to Study, the nationally recognized book, and my online course. The students in your organization can earn A plus grades in just a few hours. Get the Seven Secrets of How to Study course for your students. You won't regret it. So we are going to um, uh, go into our, our closing remarks. And so we'll, we'll start with you, uh, Dr. Spencer. Um, as I've said in this live stream and various before, don't share your negative uh, math story with, with your children. Be like Miss Wilson. Make them think you understand what's mm -hmm. going on and, and give them encouragement. And, you know, search the internet, find flashcards, ask your school, ask your principal, ask your teacher, you know, how, how can I make flashcards for various mathematic um, factors, you know, to, to work with my child? How can I work with my child um, at home? And, and one of the things that, that, that Joel and I have in common we did summer programs and after school programs from elementary school through high school. We were both in prime. Steve was there. There was a couple of comments on Facebook, Joel. People remember Dr. Jones from prime and, and, as well. Matter of fact, my assistant principal remembers um, Dr. Jones from, I think, prime and um, I think Philadelphia University way back when. Wow. Wow. 
<laughs> so, Dr. Jones? Yes, I would say um, it's, it's wonderful for students to support each other in math. Because a lot of times you see, you know, there are few of them that are interested, but support each other, encourage each other. Parents find like parents that have children that have similar interests and get them engaged in these programs. Call the university's math department, call the university's engineering department, call the university's science department and try to find out what kind of programs they have that you can get your child engaged in all these areas that will create great career opportunities. And I just want to encourage the parents. There are uh, tons of low tech ways to get your kids in interested in math. Uh, Uno cards, playing Monopoly, you know, all these type things. If they're fun, they're, they're going to have to know how to, to, to compute. They'll build, build their computational skills. And, and they don't cost a lot of money. So you don't have to go and buy the, the new, you know, iPad or I'm sorry, the, the MacBook Pro Mini. <laughs> you don't have to do that. Just just some of these low tech things and, and spend some quality time uh, with with your youth. So on that note, I want to say thank you. I think we've had just a, a great program. I want to say thank you, Dr. Spencer. Thank you, Dr. Jones. And we will see you next month. Bye. Bye.